Hi there class, this is the final video on term sheets and due diligence. We'll kick this video off with a quote from LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman, talking about what it feels like to build a startup. He says, in founding a startup, you throw yourself off a cliff and build an airplane on the way down. Our agenda for this video starts with a recap of the previous video, uh, ties up a few loose ends for the course, and then gets into the details of term sheets and due diligence. First for the recap. The last video started by asking, is the company investment worthy? And we went through about a dozen items. First, the venture capital might not be right for your company. Product risk, market risk, that all projections show growth and are lies. I cautioned against showing conservative projections and talked about needing a monopoly and a moat. The importance of product market fit and how to calculate your magic ratio. We discussed how profits cover a multitude of sins and how culture eats strategy for lunch. I shared Paul Graham's view that your company details are more important than your pitch and that when it comes to your company valuation, your fundamentals will ultimately bear out. Then we covered concepts related to delivering your pitch, starting with the concept that VCs are people too and the value of being authentic when you present, and how critical trust is in the process. We reviewed the most common steps from day one through to getting in front of investors, and the importance of the fear of missing out. We reviewed how important it is to do your research on the VC firm, and the hows and whys of getting warm introductions, including the idea that when you're seeking intros, nobody likes a taker. Prep for rejection the right way, and check out Jia Zhang's TED Talk if you haven't already. If you are rejected, there is no grand conspiracy. Dust yourself off and try again. The power dynamic is messed up during VC pitches. That's because we're used to the golden rule, which is whoever has the gold makes the rules. Know your pitch and your company cold. And despite what Paul Graham says, your story is more important than the facts. We discussed the importance of naming the enemy to generate empathy from your audience. That VCs talk to each other. And I went over the value of several presentation frameworks, including starting with one slide. And the two must-haves for any pitch, which are a compelling opportunity and a reason to believe. We reviewed the customer acquisition model and the necessity of being ruthlessly honest. Finally, we discussed the importance of understanding the story of your financial statements and how vital it is that you keep the lines of communication open. All right, that does it for our recap. Now, a couple of those loose ends. First, a word about preferred stock. When VCs invest, they typically like to purchase preferred stock. Uh, angels, on the other hand, often simply buy common stock. Now, you'll remember from your financial accounting classes that the difference between that the difference between preferred stock and common stock is that preferred has priority in a liquidation but doesn't confer voting rights like common stock does. We all get taught this, and it's a very narrow look at the real power and value of preferred stock, which is this. Preferred stock is a contract. That contract can even include voting rights, so the textbook definition is mostly useless. The power of preferred stock is that you can contract just about any terms under the sun. You could create one share of preferred stock that conferred supermajority voting rights. Preferred stock could be de designed to act like a loan and pay a dividend. It can be set up to convert to common, as most VC deals are designed to do. But the ratio doesn't have to be one to one. Preferred shares could convert at two or three to one or any other ratio. Preferred stock can be used to create a hedge. Well, what's a hedge? A hedge is a secondary way for the investor to get his or her money back. For instance, the preferred shares could pay a coupon to investors up to the point that the investment achieves return of invested capital, making any additional increases a return on capital. Or investors may be counting on the stock price reaching a certain level in order for them to capture their returns. Preferred could be structured to convert to one share of common if the price reaches a certain level, but two shares if it does not, doubling the investor's chances of getting his returns. So, in a typical VC deal, the preferred is tied to the terms of the deal. 
In traditional venture, the founder shops the company to VCs and the VCs determine the terms on which they will invest. But it's also possible for a founder to establish terms and then take those terms out as an offering to prospective investors. Traditional VCs tend to shun this approach because they like to control the deal. But angels and other investor networks invest in founder structured deals all the time. When a founder issues an offering of this type, they do it via a private placement memorandum or PPM. A PPM contains all the reasons nobody should ever invest in your company. The AQI case was structured as a PPM, albeit a rather poor one. The reason PPMs are so negatively construed is because they meet legal disclosure requirements for someone selling securities under Regulation D, Rule 506 of the Securities and Exchange Act. As such, they are like a get-out-of-jail-free card for founders. They establish safe harbors and a lot of protections because you disclose anything and everything that could go wrong. We discuss this method of financing in more detail in Finance 6310, but I want you to at least be familiar with it here. Okay, those are my loose ends. On to term sheets. When a VC decides it is interested in your company, it will issue a term sheet. The design and structure of term sheets was originally developed by these law firms on the East and West Coasts, respectively. There are a lot of details to be worked out on a venture investment. So what purposes do term sheets serve? Well, term sheets are a way to get the key terms of the deal worked out up front and come to an agreement on the basics before you spend a bunch of money on lawyers. I found that this can be an effective way of negotiating other legal agreements as well. A term sheet is non-binding. The VC doesn't have to go through with the deal, and neither do you, even after it's signed. It's uncommon for VCs to arbitrarily back out of a term sheet, and there is significant reputational risk attached to doing so. But it does happen. It's best to view a term sheet as an expression of interest and good faith between the parties as they work toward a deal. Accepting a term sheet may mean you are agreeing to pursue a deal exclus exclusively with that investor, so be wary of that. A term sheet that is issued but yet unsigned can be a tool to leverage while negotiating with other investors. This list includes the basic sections of a term sheet. Not all are used by every investor or every time. Um, I'm going to cover some of the most critical sections. We explore all the sections in detail in Finance 6310, but we'll cover the key ones here. The first section, or preamble, offers the basics. It's kind of a mini PPM in that it often contains disclosures. It's not required, this section isn't required, but when it's used it outlines the basic length of time in order to put a deal together and may include a no-shop clause. In other words, if you sign, you're agreeing to pursue a deal exclusively with this VC for the duration that's specified here. The term sheet also outlines the new securities to be issued. It includes the terms for the type of, of new shares, such as what class and or series of equity will be issued and how these shares will fall within the capital stack. In addition to the type of shares, the total amount raised, number of shares, and price per share are articulated here. In other words, all the key elements required for calculating your company valuation. One of the most concise rules I've read for understanding term sheets is this quote from Brad Feld's book, Venture Deals. He says, there are only two things that VCs really care about when making investments, economics and control. As you consider how each term impacts the economics of the deal and the control of the company, you get a good idea of which terms are most important to your investor. Jumping down a few steps to conversion, this section discusses the conditions under which preferred shares convert to common, such as in an IPO. Depending on the series, the VC may require a seat on your board of directors. Really quickly, I thought we should review that a company has natural checks and balances here. The board of directors hires the senior management team for the company. The senior management team run the company in order to create value for shareholders, and shareholders vote to elect the board of directors. In a startup, the founder, CEO, effectively represents all three. He's the major shareholder, may be the only board member, and acts as the CEO, the key senior management team member. With VC investment, there are now more shareholders, and often VC involvement on your board. These checks and balances start to mean something. VCs may require that certain decisions, which used to be solely up to the senior management, now require board approval. These might be things like large expenditures, entering into key contracts, etc. The conditions precedent. This means that if any 
if any serious item is uncovered during due diligence, that's a legitimate reason for the VC not to have to go through with the deal. Ultimately, there are sale terms for the actual purchase of equity in your company. And that's all we'll cover for term sheets for this video. We'll now move on to due diligence. The term due diligence covers typically three types or phases of diligence. The first is screening due diligence. This is what was done prior to the issuance of the term sheet. After the term sheet, the diligence kicks into high gear as the VC evaluates and verifies the key elements of the business during business due diligence. Simultaneously, there is legal due diligence, which can include things like review of any outstanding legal issues, complaints, lawsuits, attorney general actions, etc., credit and background checks on the founder and key employees, legal reviews of contracts, obligations, and the terms around each shareholder's equity. This is a review to make sure there are no legal landmines that might crop up and cause problems and potential loss of capital later on. Let's take a closer look at these two types of diligence. Again from Bradfeld, if you feel like your VC is a proctologist, run for the hills. Ultimately, the relationship still needs to function on trust. In the olden days, companies would keep a due diligence binder with hard copies of everything VCs might need to see. Nowadays, it's more common for this information to be housed in an electronic repository, like a shared folder on Dropbox or Google Drive. That said, it wasn't too many years ago that I was asked to produce hard copies as well as digital copies on CD and ship them out to a VC during diligence. In any case, these are the major sections, executive summary, the company, the business, sales marketing and distribution, financial and legal. You can include a copy of your regular executive summary here. For the company, you'll need things like your organizing documents, IRS, EIN letters, operating agreements, good standing certificates for the current year, DBAs, registered trade names, and any related entities, business licenses, professional licenses if, if any, a list of entity relationships if there's more than one entity, and any international filings. Any documents about the company uh, and its operation, such as operating documents, employee handbooks, standard operating procedure documentation, etc. Any information about your business credit, BBB rating, etc. And any recent analyst reports if they exist. You'll need to provide marketing material like key business management documents and anything related to your strategy. You'll need information on your employees, such as resumes and references for key employees, employment agreements for them, including agreements for stock options. They will want to see the org chart and a forecast of new hires you intend to make. You'll be asked for documentation on employee issues, such as terminated employees, uh, discipline or write-ups on current employees, what procedures do you have in place for managing employee turnover, etc. You'll need to describe each product you sell, how many customers you have for that product, and what they're buying it for. You'll likely need to provide customer references for both happy customers and potential customers you lost to competitors. You'll need to provide historical and projected growth numbers and support. Your product development pipeline roadmap and R&D program. An analysis of the unit economics for each product you sell. In addition to qualitative references, you'll need to identify key customers where you have customer isolation risk. VCs will want to establish the probability that these customers continue with, me, with you and understand the risks that they, might, uh, that they might cancel their contracts. You'll need to show your key info for sales, marketing, and distribution. Things like your distribution channels, how your products are positioned in the market, and what key opportunities and risks are there for each product and your current marketing program and materials. You'll want to show your customer acquisition information uh, and buyer's journey analysis if you have it, your customer acquisition costs and lifetime customer value numbers, more in-depth discussion of any key customers you may have. You'll want to break down inbound sales versus outbound sales programs. How is your sales team broken down? What is your comp plan for sales? What are their quotas and average production per salesperson? How long is your average sales cycle? What's your plan for adding additional salespeople, perhaps even more specific roles like sales development and account management? Investors will want to see your budgets and how your budget is intended to be used in order to execute your growth strategy. If you have any key vendors or value chain partners that are essential to the operation of your business, investors will want to interview them. Identify sales and profits by product and or channel. For instance, if you sell directly and through partner resellers, investors will want to understand the breakdown. An analysis on any significant geographic or seasonal impact for sales. For example, do holiday sales make up a significant portion of your annual revenue? 
Investors will want to understand the competitive landscape. Who are the competitors? Where are the competitive threats to your business? How much market share do you have, etc.? Are you doing business internationally? If so, what are the key issues there? Financial information. Your cap table fully diluted, a schedule of any financial agreements, warrants, securities, etc. Anything that could possibly impact the cap table. Pro forma operating budgets, anticipated capital expenditures, lines of credit, etc. Full pro forma financial statements, complete with assumptions, audited statements for the past two or three years if you have them. If you don't have audited statements, then provide interim unaudited financial statements. Accounts receivable and payable along with aging schedules. List of any accountants and financial service providers that you're using. Legal information. Include copies of any pending or threatened litigation by or against the company. This might seem extreme, but the average business person is sued every six to seven years. Business just keeps attorneys busy. Include documentation for any previous financings, debt or equity. Complete PPM and due diligence packages that may be, have been put together for others. Copies of any contracts or agreements, etc. Any IP protections such as patents, trademarks, copyrights, etc. Include customer contracts if you have them and any HR documentation. Descriptions of any environmental or employee safety liabilities. Copies of insurance policies and coverage. Discussion of any risks and exposures. Any regulatory issues, SEC filings, public or private. Regulator examinations, reports or reviews. Attorney general complaints, etc. A list of any company attorneys. And that does it for our agenda on this video. I'll make one more plug that if you enjoyed the content of this course and you aren't graduating this semester, consider taking the advanced course, Finance 6310. It's similar in how it's laid out, but it covers two sessions or 10 weeks, so we can go into more depth on these topics about venture capital. Finally, I'll leave you with this parting thought from famed Peter Drucker. As you look to the future, remember that the best way to predict the future is to create it. That's it for this video. Good luck to you in all your future pursuits. I genuinely hope you've picked up some principles and information that you can use in your future careers. It's been my pleasure to be your instructor. All the best.